Hi there and welcome to our special revision webinar looking at fixed and floating exchange rate systems. This is a really important macro topic. Uh, the, the choice of exchange rate system that a country operates with is one of the most important parts of monetary policy. Uh, we're going to take a look at free floating, managed floating and fixed exchange rate systems. Free floating system is where the, the external value of the currency depends completely on market forces of currency supply and demand. The next version is a managed floating system where essentially the central bank, often operating on behalf of the government, chooses to intervene occasionally or frequently in the foreign exchange markets and where the exchange rate becomes a key target of policy. And of course the third option is a variant of a fixed exchange rate system where a country des decides to anchor or peg their currency to another currency or to a basket of exchange rates. So we'll take each in turn and we'll look at some good examples. It'd be really useful to have your currency notes from school in front of you so you can add to your existing notes as we go through, really make these revision notes work for you. Here's the, the current state of play when it comes to exchange rate systems. This is courtesy of the IMF. There are some countries that don't have their own separate legal tender. So if you're in San Marino, for example, you use the euro. If you're in Zimbabwe, you can use a range of currencies. The dollar will be probably the most valuable. Some countries have a fixed exchange rate in a currency board system. They back their currency with enough foreign currency to back it. And Hong Kong is pegged, for example, to the US dollar. Bulgaria is pegged to the euro. Some countries have a conventional fixed exchange rate. Really good example. Saudi Arabia is fixed to the US dollar. Denmark is inside the... Uh, European Union but outside the single currency but the krona in Denmark is fixed to the euro as it is in Senegal. Nepal and Kuwait have a, a fixed exchange rate against a basket of other currencies. Then as we're moving down the list some countries have a kind of crawling peg semi-fixed exchange rate so China allows their currency the yuan or the renminbi to move a little bit each day but it's controlled so essentially it's a kind of hybrid system. Ethiopia has a semi-fixed exchange rate too, so does Croatia inside the single European Union. Increasingly, countries are now moving towards managed floating exchange rates, including the likes of Brazil, uh, Turkey, Mexico, Chile, um, India. Okay, These countries are they have central banks that are now prepared to intervene in the market. And of course, Japan, crucially, does that many times as part of Abenomics. <coughs> Pardon me. Some countries have a free floating exchange rate, relatively few, they tend to be big countries, Australia, Canada, United States, the UK, and the Eurozone. The Eurozone is a floating exchange rate. So here's a good example of a fixed exchange rate. The Danish krona is fixed against the Euro. Yes, the Currency can move up and down a little bit, as you can see, but basically it's fixed at around 7.437 to the euro. That's over a one-year perspective. A good example of a, of a floating currency is the Polish Zloty, S-L-O-T-Y. Now, the Zloty is a floating currency, but as you can see, in 2008, it fell quite sharply against uh, against the euro. So this, this movement here is a, a depreciation in the Zloty. Um, it went from 3.2 Zloty to the euro to nearly nearly five, big depreciation. Since then, and then and then strengthened, particularly as the eurozone went into crisis, but since then the, the Polish Zloty has been relatively stable, depreciating a little bit. It's currently just under 4.5 Zloty to the euro. But you don't necessarily have to have a volatile currency if you have a floating currency. In this case, the Zloty has been relatively stable against the euro. So free floating exchange rates are basically where the value of the currency, the external value, is set by the market. The relative strength or weakness of a currency depends on the supply of and demand for a currency in the foreign exchange markets. The central bank allows the currency to find its own, own level. There's no official intervention. And crucially, the exchange rate is not repeat is not a target of macro policy. Doesn't mean the exchange rate isn't unimportant, it just means it's not a target of policy. And here's a good example of floating exchange rate. Of course, the pound is a floating exchange rate. Here we see the pound against the dollar in blue, sorry, in um, grey, 
against the euro in orange and on a trade weighted basis. Note in particular the depreciation of sterling after the Brexit vote in June of 2016, quite a significant fall in the pound. This is emphasised by the next slide, which shows the daily currency exchange rate of sterling against the euro. So it went from about 1 euro 31 straight down to 1 euro 20. The pound has been relatively weak since, but it's stabilising a little bit. Crucially, if the pound or a floating currency falls, we call that a depreciation. If a fixed exchange rate falls, we call that a devaluation. Important to get the terminology right for the exam. A couple of examples of currencies in the news at the moment. Uh, the Irish, so the Icelandic krona is definitely in the news. They, they've had a floating exchange rate um, in recent years, particularly as they've tried to recover from the financial crisis, which hit their banking sector very badly in 2008-2009. But actually, they've just lifted their capital controls. So there's now a much greater ability to move money in and out of Iceland. And the Icelandic government is considering introducing a peg, a, a fixed exchange rate against the euro. Now, that may or may not happen. Iceland will need foreign exchange reserves for that to, to work. Very interesting article in Bloomberg News by L. Elian on the fact that a currency peg is not necessarily a cure-all or panacea for a country like Iceland. Country which has a, a managed floating exchange rate, which is in crisis at the moment, is Turkey. The Turkish lira has fallen hugely against the US dollar in particular. In part, this is a result of political instability, the failed coup in 2016. But Turkey also has a very large current account deficit on the balance of payments. Investors are getting nervous. So there's quite a bit of capital flight, people leaving, taking their money out of Turkey. And basically, the central bank in Turkey has tried to prevent a fall in the currency, but with limited effect. This is a good example of a country where you try to manage the exchange rate, but actually the forces at work in the currency markets are so strong, it becomes very hard to achieve currency stability. So they've tried to raise interest rates to stabilize the exchange rate, but of course that risks causing an even deeper recession in Turkey. So the opposite of a floating exchange rate is a fixed exchange rate. This is where the external value of the currency is, is anchored or pegged to one or more currencies. And crucially, the, the central bank must hold enough foreign exchange reserves in case they need to intervene to maintain the fixed peg. Once a, a fixed exchange rate has been agreed, typically most trade, cross-border trade, takes place at the official rate, providing it's become acceptable. But obviously, if it's not an acceptable rate, then you're going to get the emergence of shadow or secondary markets where people are prepared to, to make trades at different exchange rates unofficially, particularly if you've got a, a separate reserve currency like the US dollar. Occasionally, with a fixed exchange rate, you have to realign the currency up or down. So an upward movement would be a revaluation. A fall would be a devaluation, particularly if it's become unsustainable. In other words, the currency has moved away from fundamental value. Interesting case at the moment is what's happening in China. China moved away from a fixed exchange rate in 2005 against the dollar. It then moved to a kind of semi-fixed exchange rate system, which has morphed into a kind of managed semi-float. Um, occasional devaluation, for example, of the yuan, in particular in 2015. China wants the yuan to become a significant world currency and they're nudging, edging closer to have, towards a sort of free float, full convertibility of the Chinese currency. But this article from Bloomberg, March 2017, uh, suggests a report from Societe Generale saying that actually that if you're waiting for China to go to free floating, you're probably going to wait quite a long time. It's not ready to move there yet. The hybrid systems we've talked about include managed floating exchange rates. So this is where day to day, a currency holds its own value, determined by the market, but on occasions, certain times, a central bank may intervene. So if their currency is weak and they want it to appreciate, they go into the market and buy their own currency by selling foreign exchange reserves. If they want their currency to weaken, to go down in value, to depreciate, they go to the market and sell their currency and in exchange buy foreign reserves. And of course, they can change their own policy interest rates.
uh, cut in interest rates, for example, should bring about a depreciation. It leads to hot money flows leaving the country. A crucial point is once you start to manage the exchange rate, the exchange rate becomes a key target of monetary policy. And some countries are using the idea of competitive devaluation, where they're deliberately trying to bring their currency down a peg or two to make their manufacturing or their other export industries more competitive. There are tools in which you can manage the floating exchange mm. rate. The obvious one is to use interest rates. To the, so A change in relative interest rates will affect inflows and outflows of hot money. Quantitative easing, QE, also has an impact on the exchange rate. So, for example, if a central bank expands their QE programme and creates more base money, some of that money will leave the economy and will put downward pressure on the exchange rate. And that's certainly been the case for a number of countries, including the United States and the UK, where QE has been quite large. Central banks can also direct, directly intervene in the markets. And the fourth point is at the bottom of the slide here, that sometimes you can use fiscal policy to manipulate the exchange rate. For example, you might put a special tax on foreign deposits in your banks that makes that money less profitable and should in turn uh, perhaps reverse hot money flows. Interesting, another story in the news at the moment is the Mexican peso. So when Trump got elected in November 2016, there was a significant fall depreciation in the peso. The Mexican central bank intervened to try and stop it falling to ultra low levels. They had limited success. Of course, if they raise interest rates to try and stop the peso from falling, they risk causing a recession in Mexico. But the Mexican currency is now much lower than it was a year ago against the dollar. It's great news if you're a Mexican company trying to export to the States, although there might be a tariff on the way. It's also great news if you're a Mexican in the States sending dollars back to Mexico City because your remittances are worth more in, in real terms. But crucially, it's bad news for Mexican families for whom the cost of food imports has, has shot up. So what kind of system should countries choose? Should they go for a floating exchange rate or should they go for a fixed exchange rate? Let's think about uh, floating exchange rates first of all. Essentially, the argument for floating is that if you, if you go for a floating currency, including, for example, Poland, the UK, United States, you don't necessarily need to hold big foreign currency reserves because you're not intervening in the market. Second argument is it allows a country to operate an independent monetary policy, free from an exchange rate target. A country can set interest rates, for example, to try to sustain growth, to try and control inflation. And of course, the Bank of England doesn't have to meet an exchange rate target when it's deciding on base rates. A third point is really quite important. Uh, a floating exchange rate becomes almost like a, a shock absorber or an automatic stabiliser when there's a downspin in the world economy. So say, for example, the value of your exports goes down, or there's been some sort of negative shock affecting your economy, Typically, your currency would fall in value, and that helps make your export sectors more competitive. Um, in a sense, it helps to stabilise output and jobs and confidence. And that was particularly the case with countries such as Poland in 2008. And also, you can make a case for saying the UK in 2008-2009 when the pound fell, and of course the pound fell post-Brexit. So the fall in the pound, if you like, is a bit of ballast, helps to stabilise the economy. A lower floating currency provides, in theory, a partial auto-correction for a current account deficit. And there's probably less risk of the currency getting significantly under or overvalued because the markets are setting the exchange rate and if markets are relatively efficient, they should be pricing the currency properly. On the flip side, the evaluation of these points is there's no guarantee the floating exchange rate will be stable. It can be quite volatile. And that volatility could could be a barrier to attracting foreign investment. And crucially, of course, a more competitive exchange rate doesn't necessarily improve your balance of payments. Think about the J-curve theory, think about the Marshall learning condition, and think about the importance of non-price competitiveness in driving exports. What about fixed exchange rates? Well, some countries like a stable fixed exchange rate. Um, the Danes, for example, fix their currency against the euro. Why? Well, the certainty of currency value is perhaps a, a good stimulus to inward investment. People investing in your currency, in your economy, 
will know what the exchange rate is going to be. It takes away some of the risk factor. It also reduces some of the costs of businesses having to hedge in currency markets, form of insurance. Crucially, it helps to control inflation. If you've controlled, if you've fixed your exchange rate against a low inflation country, then your businesses have to keep their unit costs under control. Otherwise, they're just going to lose market share as they get priced out of markets. Fourth point is subtle, but I think quite important. If you know you've got a fixed exchange rate, and if you know that inflation is going to be relatively low, that creates more certainty in the bond markets. The lower risk factor should bring down the cost of borrowing for governments and also long-term borrowing for the businesses. It tends to make governments run responsible policies because if they allow the inflation to get out of control, businesses will just become less competitive. They can't rely on the exchange rate to depreciate. And providing the fixed exchange rate is credible, providing people accept the anchor has been set, there should be less speculation in the foreign exchange markets. Speculators tend to attack what they perceive is the weakest currency in a, in a system and test the resolve of policymakers. On the other side, evaluation points. If you have a fixed exchange rate, you have less freedom to use interest rates for other macro objectives such as jobs. With a fixed exchange rate, monetary policy is geared towards managing or fixing the exchange rate. Many small developing emerging countries just don't have the FX reserves to be able to intervene to maintain the currency. And we've seen that happen in recent years. And crucially, uh, it's quite difficult for countries to use a competitive devaluation of their exchange rate because other countries then accuse them of deliberately devaluing their currency to become more competitive. And that can trigger a protectionist response. If you do devalue a fixed exchange rate, although it might make your exports more competitive, Many exports require imports and they're more expensive and it also tends to lead to a rise in inflation which is particularly bad news for, for poorer families. So overall on balance there's a kind of there's a big always a big debate about what kind of exchange rate system countries are going to use. If anything there's a move towards countries using managed exchange rates in part because they've run out of room to change interest rates and this managing of the exchange rate is giving rise to fears of of countries getting locked into currency wars with each other. So this is a hot topic in economics and one that's definitely worth following in the weeks and months to come. So thanks for tuning in to this revision webinar on fixed and floating exchange rates.